Uh, thank you, uh, Daniela, for inviting me to uh, participate. Uh, thank you to Sages for the opportunity to talk. Um, I'm, I'm going to have much less data in my slides, and, and thank you for the intro. I, I think that uh, the role of surgery is, is changing, and uh, obviously we had some great talks today that are going to help uh, clarify how I treat and how our practice, I think, treats uh, Barrett's. So uh, disclosures, um, uh, none of these are pertinent to, to this discussion. Um, objectives for my talk, uh, really to talk about the role for anti-reflux surgery in Barrett's esophagus, um, discuss the role for esophagectomy um, in Barrett's, and then also just look at some novel surgical techniques for mucosal resection, uh, just so we you know, keep the surgeons uh, working on this. Um, a little bit of background. This is stuff that everybody knows, but fund application uh, has been shown to uh, limit the progression of Barrett's uh, by reducing acid and bile reflux. Uh, this has been shown in multiple papers. Here's just an example from Moschlager um, at the University of Washington. Um, esophagectomy was the standard of care, uh, and this is from now 10 years old. Um, for patients with long segment Barrett's and or uh, high grade dysplasia uh, and concern for invasive adenocarcinoma. We've seen some slides now that show us how that has shifted uh, over the last couple of years. Um, and really I think the key thing to remember from this talk is that there's an evolving role for surgery uh, with the advent of endoscopic therapy. And, and where we are right now I think is not 100% clear. So uh, main things that I'll talk about in terms of role of surgery in Barrett's is really, I think, two things, acid suppression and then tissue resection. I think that those are um, really where we are from a, a surgical standpoint in, in terms of uh, laparotomies or laparoscopic um, procedures. Um, role for anti-reflux surgery, I think the gold standard right now is, is um, uh, Nissen fund application, um, and I think that can be used uh, to reduce the progression or recurrence of Barrett's. Uh, it's an alternative to acid suppression. I think we just saw a great talk on that. Um, the, uh, when you have the presence of hiatal hernias, I think that that changes um, what your treatment paradigm should be and would favor uh, utilizing surgery for a, a Nissen fund application. Um, and it also can be combined now with endoscopic therapy, um, as I think we just heard about, to uh, minimize the recurrence or progression of Barrett's, or even for maybe some T1A or T1B uh, adenocarcinomas, depending on the, the situation in the patient. Uh, there is a, a, a lot of data that shows that uh, patients with Barrett's esophagus and who've had laparoscopic Nissen fund applications um, can have regression uh, of their disease um, or a decrease in their metas uh, metaplasia or dysplasia. Um, not everyone uh, gets this benefit, though. Some people do uh, progress uh, while still uh, or after having uh, had a fund application. Uh, there have been a number of studies uh, comparing anti-reflux surgery, and again, I think the gold standard on that is uh, laparoscopic Nissen or a partial fund application versus medical therapy. Um, there may be a slight benefit from surgery, and uh, uh, there may be some argument on that also. Uh, there are a couple of meta-analyses uh, that looked at um, surgery versus uh, optimal medical therapy um, that suggests there may be a reduced risk of uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma development in the surgical group um, and maybe a slight uh, uh, increase in regression uh, of Barrett's in the surgical group. Um, but there really was, uh, uh, in, in all of these studies, um, maybe trends but not necessarily uh, statistically significant um, findings. Uh, there's been a lot of endoscopic therapies now trying to mimic laparoscopic fund application. I just put these out here in terms of plication, injections, ablative therapies. Um, uh, there's been really, I think, no published data looking at these uh, types of uh, procedures and, and their effects on Barrett's. I, I think there's a lot of uh, data about the reduction in terms of uh, uh, reflux and the reduction in pH, uh, but there's really uh, uh, no data in terms of uh, any of these procedures and their effect on uh, Barrett's esophagus. So I think laparoscopic Nissen fund application is really still the gold standard from a surgical standpoint or a procedural standpoint um, for Barrett's esophagus. So let's uh, shift gears now a little bit and talk about the role for esophagectomy in Barrett's esophagus. Um, and again, and this is evolving over the last, I think, 10 years as endoscopic therapy has become uh, better, uh, both in terms of um, uh, staging as well as re uh, resection for cure. Um, I think that there's still a role for esophagectomy if you're at a high volume center where you can do an esophagectomy safely. I think that's key. Um, and this is from a review article here, but talking about a couple, I think, of key um, areas when you have uh, histology that's poorly differentiated or shows lymphovascular invasion. Um, or you have a deep margin or T1B depth, I think is, uh, is shown uh, or suggested in the previous talk. 
Um, if you have uh, difficult to remove dysplastic uh, Barrett's esophagus, uh, either long segment or ultra long segment Barrett's esophagus, uh, multifocal disease or, or nodular um, uh, Barrett's uh, with concerns for intramucosal adenocarcinoma, I think are all indications still for esophagectomy. Um, there are also concerns about recurrent disease after endoluminal therapy and, and or subsquamous recurrence or buried um, dysplasia or buried uh, uh, adenocarcinomas. Um, some people may have structural esophageal concerns and that you can break that down in terms of uh, severe motility disorders or strictures. And so if people are having significant strictures and you can do an esophagectomy safely, I think that that still has a role. Uh, in our practice, if someone has a large uh, parasophageal hiatal hernia, in addition to Barrett's esophagus and, and you're struggling to control that, um, sometimes an esophagectomy may be also a, an option in terms of therapy. Uh, in terms of pros, obviously uh, pros with esophagectomy ensures a resection you know, in terms of especially with lymph nodes. I think that gives you better prognostic uh, information. Obviously the cons uh, for esophagectomy, even in high volume centers, you're going to have a 30 to 50 percent um, uh, mortality and morbidity or uh, morbidity rate at least, um, though the mortality rate can be down to less than 2 percent and at least a 30 day mortality. Um, uh, obviously the other cons is a huge change in lifestyle and I think everyone here is or familiar with that. So um, I think the type of esophagectomy really matters um, depending on what you're doing. Um, and if you're doing it for, especially for ultra long segment Barrett's esophagus, I think doing an Ivor Lewis um, where you're putting the anastomosis in the chest um, where you may leave um, some Barrett's uh, still in the uh, proximal esophagus obviously makes no sense. So I think that you have to be able to do either a transhiatal or a three field esophagectomy and make sure that your anastomosis is in the neck um, above all the uh, area of dysplastic tissue. Um, I know that there's been a lot of literature published about a vagal sparing esophagectomy, um, but uh, to be quite honest, I think that now with endoscopic therapy, um, if you're going to esophagectomy, most often you're going to be concerned about lymph nodes, and I'm not sure that a vagal sparing esophagectomy makes a lot of sense, uh, at least not to me. In our practice, we don't perform those, though I know there are a number of centers that do, um, but that, that's, I think, our bias. So, uh, you know, who, who should get surgery? Um, so I, I think that we talked, to, we alluded to this in the, in the previous talk, um, but I, I think surgery still has a significant role for your patient population. Um, obviously there are patients who are um, not going to be compliant either with medications or surveillance endoscopies. Um, also the similar, those patients who may have a limited ability to follow up. Um, at the University of Michigan, we're near Detroit, um, and, the, and patients may drive an hour or less to get to us. But we also have patients who are coming from the Upper Peninsula, which they may be driving seven to eight hours. Um, and those patients don't have uh, skilled endoscopy uh, available in between that eight-hour drive. And, and so I think you have to look at your institution and look at your program overall in terms of what you have to offer. But if, if those patients have limited ability for follow-up, um, a lot of the surveillance doesn't make, a lot, uh, make sense. Uh, again, as I talked about, I think the presence of a hiatal hernia or especially a large hiatal hernia can change management uh, depending on what you're able to do from an endoscopic uh, therapy. And then obviously um, uh, if you're unable to control the disease endoscopically either due to the length of the disease or the depth of the disease, then I think surgery, especially an esophagectomy, uh, plays a role. So uh, last thing, just to uh, talk about, there's... Um, uh, novel surgical techniques. Um, I, I found this article, and, and then uh, uh, this is from Rush, um, and this is, uh, you can see a laparoscopic transgastric esophageal mucosal resection, um, where uh, it's 11 patients over a uh, number of years who had both a laparoscopic Nissen and curl repair performed with a transgastric uh, resection of their Barrett's mu mucosa. Um, and uh, there, I was just at a meeting last week where a thoracic surgeon presented uh, some of her data doing a similar type of approach, which we all thought was absolutely crazy. But having said that, clearly there's uh, some novel stuff going on. Um, and uh, I just wanted, I'm not advocating for this, but just to be aware that this is uh, what's out there. And there are at least two centers that are doing it. So. Um, I put on here, lastly, a, a picture of an esophagus. Um, given, I think, the state of today's talks, I mean, I'm not sure how much more we're going to be doing esophagectomy for uh, at least this, Bar for Barrett's esophagus, but just so, uh, mainly for the trainees, so you know what an esophagus looks like after it's cut out. So, thank you.